Good afternoon, everyone. It seems that we are experiencing some technical difficulties on the We're side of our joined us. Okay. okay, Isabel. Okay. My audio is kind of a little wonky there. Uh, but yeah, for those of you that have not joined us before, this is a segment that we created to kind of teach people that there are way more careers out there versus just being a vet if you're interested in the humane studies. So with us today is Sergeant Padilla and Officer Goats. How are you guys doing today? Doing well. <laughs> awesome sauce. I'm glad to hear that. Before we get rocking and rolling, we do have a couple of webinar reminders to go through with you guys. So I can have the amazing Michelle polos up for me. There we go. Alrighty guys, so fairly typical webinar reminders if you've joined us before, but this is an auto audio visual presentation. So all of you guys are automatically muted and we can't see you, but you can see and hear us. If you do have any questions, which I heavily encourage them, please use the chat box feature in your web panels that lets us know anything you guys might have a question of. Please don't use the raise your hand function because we won't see it. Like you know, today's webinar is on our canine officers. So we're gonna learn everything canine and police related today. We do have some upcoming webinars with you guys. So we do have our animal um, adventures workshop clues at kids space which i'm also going to be in so please tune in may 23rd from 12 to 1. it's gonna be fun if for any reason you do have to get up and leave during the webinar do not worry we will be recording this and sending it to your registration email and without further ado let's get into the skinny of it guys so I guess kind of before we really get into the, the details, I wanted to know what are each of your titles as far as your canine um, officer duties go and what exactly is it that you guys do? Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and start off. Uh, I'm the canine sergeant for the Pasadena Police Department. I've been the sergeant for uh, probably about five years in the canine unit. Uh, this is the first year um, I've had a dog, so I'm learning. So this is new to me, being a handler. Uh, but as far as my daily, uh, my daily job is to ensure that the officers go to their trainings, um, attend the trainings with the dogs, so the dogs are proficient, and when the dogs are called on uh, for duty, uh, the dogs perform well and the handlers perform well. Um, I'm also in charge of uh, veterinary bills, <laughs> paying them, <laughs> setting them up, um, make sure all our dogs are healthy, and ensuring that the handlers keep the dogs healthy. Uh, and, and finally. Okay. Do a lot of demonstrations, so you know I'm usually called first, and then I'll uh, I'll, I'll have my handlers go out and meet uh, Boy Scout units, Girl Scout units, uh, church groups, uh, the community, uh, any, anywhere where we can uh, bring a positive impact to the community, and and, and by utilizing utilizing the dogs. Okay, and how about you, Officer Goats? So my name's uh, Officer Goats. I've been passing you for about five years now. Uh, been a handler for two. Uh, my dog is a patrol dog, and uh, so he's dual purpose patrol dog and detection. And he does explosive detection. So we work a lot at the Rose Bowl, Rose Parade, um, Green Street, Amphitheater, anywhere really there's a package call, stuff like that. Um, our patrol function, day to day patrol function, uh, we respond to uh, ringing alarms. So alarm goes off at your house, uh, Charlie and I will go there. Check it out, make sure everything's safe. Um, and we back officers dur during their routine calls. Um, you know, dogs use a force multiplier. A lot of people don't like messing with dogs. So um, it's just another tool in our toolbox to keep people safe, so. Okay, and yeah, I feel like that's very much true. Like officer, okay, scary dog, definitely backing off. So it makes perfect sense with that. Sometimes, um, yeah. <laughs> So what is it that got you guys thinking about, hey, I'd love to work with a dog as a partner? I'll let Ryan, I'll defer to Ryan well, on that. I grew up with dogs pretty much my whole life. Nothing, you know, other than just your normal pets at home. Um, as soon as we got, as soon as I got here, you know, it was always, hey, find your niche, find what, you know, you want to do, what you want to, you know, be good at or, 
you know, where you can help out the most. Um, you know, when I went to the academy, they're like, hey, what are your goals for when you get out of canines? Um, for whatever reason, that was just what kind of I was drawn to. Um, these dogs are amazing animals. Uh, they help us out a lot, save a lot of time. And I mean, they are a headache sometimes, but, you know, the end result and of a properly trained team um, is, is very, very good um, to help out the department as a whole and as community relations. Um, so it was one of those things. Uh, I, I reached out to the canine handlers that were here at the time. Um, one is who, who has since retired. I uh, went out and started being the, de the decoy, which is basically you put on the bite suit and you, you play the bad guy and you get bitten by dogs. Um, it's not normal for everybody to do that, um, but I enjoyed it. I learned a lot about dog behavior, um, which is huge later on when I became a handler. Um, so that's pretty much how I got into it. Okay. That's actually really funny that you mentioned the bite suit because I've always seen it and I've always been like, how bad does it hurt in that suit? Like, can, can you feel the crunch down? Uh, depending on the dog, yes. Um, dogs with bigger mouths and, you know, you have like a German, a big German Shepherd, you're going to feel it. Um, you know, we, we go to trainings a lot. We train a lot with the dogs. So you learn how to uh, kind of avoid taking the brunt of it for the most part. So the suit okay. does most of the work for you and you don't really get beat up a whole lot, um, but you do get bruises and, and little cuts here and there. But, you know, I enjoy, that's weird, but I enjoy that. I enjoy, you know, getting bit by the, you know, dogs and, and, and you know, increasing their drive and shaping their behavior to what we want them to do. All right, as long as you love what you do, right? That's what matters. <laughs> and wear sleeves, so we're good. <laughs> so, I guess at the root of it, since you always knew that you wanted to go into this and this was something that interests you, how were you able to get started? Like, where did that spark start for you in the academy, I guess? Uh, I had friends of mine in the academy that were dog handlers in the military. Um, okay. And they were always, hey, you know, these dogs saved lives of soldiers and, you know, whether it's explosive detection or finding the bad guys, stuff like that. So I'm like, cool. So, you know, YouTube's always a great, uh, source for information so i just started youtube and stuff um, got in contact with our handlers here and then went out to our kennel um, where we procure our dogs from and started decoying and kind of just got more involved and you know started studying really uh, dog behavior and then that helps out obviously when you want to become a handler um, mm -hmm. you know your dog behavior what your dog's doing why your dog's doing that it really helps you out later on when you become a handler you know what your dog's doing, you know why he's doing it and uh, how to, you know, maybe he's not doing something you want, put him in the right direction to where he can most like help benefit us. And the, the goal here is keep people safe, whether it's our officers, the public, me, um, you know, with using our tools, right? They have great sense of smell, um, mm -hmm. way better than ours. So that's why we use them and it helps us out a lot. So. Okay, and how about you, Sergeant Padilla? How did you end up in your role? About uh, four years ago, I was asked to take on the canine program uh, as a supervisor uh, without a dog, and I spent four years watching uh, the amount of work that these guys put in. Uh, the last four canine handlers, uh, I helped choose, and a lot of it was uh, because of their drive. These guys would come out on their own time, take bites from dogs, uh, pick the brain of the handler, and ask him, you know, what does it take to be a handler? And, and they kept on coming, and, and I couldn't get rid of them. <laughs> so uh, All right. it came time to, you know, to have an opening, and, and these guys applied. Mm -hmm. um, I already knew what they were about. I already knew their work ethic. I already knew their maturity, because it takes a lot of maturity to have a dog. Um, this part is with you 24-7. Um, it lives with you. It lives with your family. So it's important that you find the right person. Um, that can handle both family life and life with a dog. Because uh, you can be called out at any time on a bomb threat. You can be called out any time on a, on a, on a containment where we need to apprehend a suspect immediately. And, mm -hmm. and dog is the best tool to use for that time. It could be at 2 a.m. in the morning. It could be at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, these guys are ready for it because they train with their dogs every single day. And, and I don't have to worry about um, questioning what they do out in the field 
when it comes time for deployment because of all the training and experience that they have, uh, either from listening to other handlers or, um, you know, what I see every day when they go out and train. Okay. And I feel like that ends up building a great relationship just within your unit itself. The fact that you're so comfortable with these officers and you understand each of them individually. So that's great. Well, well you have to. I mean, uh, these guys handle dogs. They've been handling dogs for, I think, we, two years, Ryan, right? Yeah, two years for me. Two years. Uh, I mean, that's a lot of training. That's a lot of experience with dogs. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, myself, I've only had my dog for eight weeks. So um, it, it's imperative that I rely on them. Um, and, and the stars and the, the stripes and, and, and the supervision title doesn't mean anything when you're out there training because these guys, uh, they're hard on you when they critique. You know, they say, hey, you're not doing this right, or you need to do this, or you need to do that, or, you know, did you see your dog do this? And if I miss a cue, you know, I can tell, like, okay, they're not happy with me right now. So I have to, you know, step up my game because this is all new to me. You know, the same observations that they've been doing for two years, hey, I'm learning that. And uh, I, think it's, I think it's great because uh, these guys have the maturity, they have the, uh, uh, the, the experience, and they're, they're great instructors. So I've learned a lot with my dog. She's an explosive dog, um, single purpose though. So she is okay. also an engagement tool. So she doesn't go out and apprehend suspects. She comes out, she does her detection, and then if we have an event, we bring her out and uh, we show her off to the community and we show, you know, what these dogs are capable of doing uh, uh, to help us out. And like Ryan said, you know, with the Rose Bowl and the concerts that we have, the soccer games, uh, the events at the convention center, and then, you know, of course we have Cal Tech in our city. Um, so. You never know when there's going to be a threat there um, or whenever they're going to need our services, too. So uh, you'd be surprised, uh, you know, what goes on in Pasadena that people don't know about with, uh, you know, um, dignitaries that come into town and stay for the weekend. So we get called upon by federal agencies. I think last year, even though there was a pandemic, there was a uh, uh, playoff baseball at Dodger Stadium. Well, all the teams stayed at a hotel in Pasadena. So Ryan spent five days every morning, you know, searching the buses with the dog. And, um, you know, you build relationships there, too, because you meet the security staff, you meet the players, you meet um, the coaches, uh, you meet the people at the hotel uh, and build these working relationships with them. And, and these working relationships, they'll call you back and say, hey, whenever they need help, um, they'll call, you know, Officer Getz, they'll call Officer Presswich out or any other officer that they feel comfortable with. And, that, and that, I think that's great. Yeah, that speaks great things about building that foundation, not only in your community, but way outside of it. So I guess my next question would be, are there any special requirements that you need to meet to be able to start working with the canine or just even learning? Anyway. Special requirements. <laughs> well, oh, I don't know. Like, do you need to pass a dog behavior test or, you know, anything along those lines? Well, you know, we do, we do ask uh, prior to an opening for officers to come out and and take a bite from one of our dogs uh, in a bite suit. Because if you're not comfortable taking bites in a bite suit, um, it's going to be hard being a handler. Because these guys put on bite suits every day or every week, um, either or, depending on how many days they're working. And they help each other out. So one day it's somebody's turn to do the bite suit. The next day it's somebody else's turn. So having someone who isn't a handler, who wants to become a handler, uh, wear the bite suit for us, it allows my handlers to get more work in with their dogs because they don't have to be switching out changing suits. That person that does agitation for us uh, gets the opportunity to listen to what the handlers do when they talk to each other after about whether, what their dogs did right, what their dogs did wrong. They learn about dog behavior. They learn how to agitate. Of course, my handlers get to know what type of person that is and if they're going to be compatible with the dog um, later yeah. on if we decide to have an opening. Okay. So with all that considered, what... And I'm going to pose this question to you, Officer Getz. What is what you would describe as the hardest part of your job? Hardest part. Hardest part is the the balance of of you know you want your dog to do something specific, right? Whether it be searching for bad guys or locating odor, right? You got to have a short term mm -hmm. memory with the dogs. They have a brain of their own. They can think to an extent. And they kind of mm -hmm. sometimes want to do whatever they want to do, you know, and I have to do my job, which is redirect him to what I want him to do, because that's what the task at hand, right? We're looking for a bad guy. Can't be over mm -hmm. running around, 
playing with toys in somebody's in somebody's backyard because it happens. Um, but my <laughs> job is to get them back. I would say the the most difficult thing is, you know, separating like, hey, get back here, and then he doesn't listen to you. So now like the frustration mm -hmm. level, your frustration level goes up, right? And then you finally get them back, and then you know you get the behavior you want, and then cool that whatever just happened, you're frustrated, goes away. Right, you got to forget about it now task at hand we're back on the search i think as a new handler that was probably one of the things that was the most difficult to grasp um mm -hmm. you know we have a new handler going in right uh, going he just got out of basic right now and we're teaching and we're kind of training him up to be to where we're at um and you know he's obviously has the, some of the new guy issues that um like like that like he gets frustrated over like little things it's like hey bro like it's a win you know, you got your dog back. Cool. Tell him a good boy and then send him back on a search. So it's being able to balance that and to, uh, you know, not take everything so serious with the dogs. Like he has a brain. He's just trying to do what you think he wants you to, what he wants to do. You know, like I'm telling him to go search. Cool. He's going to go search. And if he doesn't go search, I'm not going to get too mad about it, but I got to do my job and get him back and, you know, have him do what I want him to do. Like there's time for play later. Like we go home. He's just a dog. And yeah. you go out, my, go out in my backyard and have a great time and just be a dog. There's no, you know, you know, obedience by me. There's we're not doing anything, any drills or training at home. He's just a dog at home. But when he gets in my car and we come to work, it's work time. So being able to balance that and to understand when to turn it on, turn it off for the dogs is probably the most difficult thing for people to learn. Yeah, and I can definitely see where that can really especially come into play when there's so many factors especially when you know you're out and about and you're working with like noises sights smells because yeah sometimes dogs are going to be dogs but it's great that you guys have figured out how to walk that balance yeah. so that's actually really interesting um you guys kept mentioning learning dog behavior and things like that were there any other ways that you guys learn dog behavior besides um, actually working with your dogs? Were there any like courses that you had to take or was it just on the job training? So a little bit of both. Um, okay. little, so the root of like police dogs comes from Europe, from the sport. So whether it's the, the Schützen in Germany, the KMPV uh, in Dutch, the IPO. So like Charlie's from Slovakia, so he's an IPO dog never titled anything like that but they do certain training with them so if, if you had to like make a correlation and be like golf here is like the kennels in europe so you get a puppy you go to a kennel and for the first 18 months you do nothing but put the, you know be the be the bad guy put the bite suit on and then slowly you'll be able to work that puppy up and you put them you take them to the trials and any uh, awards you win go to that kennel so that's kind of where it all comes from. You can Google it and look it up and watch the sport. It's there's a lot of similarities, um, but there's certain stuff that yeah uh, the sports do that we don't necessarily like, and then vice versa. So like we're all about keeping people safe, and in sport mm -hmm. that, that's not really a concern because it's a sterile environment. You know when we're out mm -hmm. on a search, I got you know five search members with me, and we're looking for a bad guy. And I have a dog running around, you know, I have to be cognizant of everything, you know, where we're at. Can he get out of somebody's backyard or, you know, does a resident come out of the house? I got to call him back. Where are my search team members? You know, so there's a lot of balance um, kind of goes hand in hand with watching the sports stuff. Um, mm -hmm. It's a good that's a good base to understand kind of like what we expect out of the dogs. Now, he's not, he's not a trial dog and his obedience is not that great. Good enough. But, you know. <laughs> That's something I have to understand and work with, right? Channel what he's good at and kind of build him up in the other areas he's not so good at. So a lot of the videos, decoying. I went. I just got back uh, last week. I went to a four-day class, um, basically how to be a decoy and take bites from dogs. Um, by a guy named Franco Angelini. He's world world renowned in the decoy world. Um, four days, ton of information. Um, for me, that was, it was awesome. You know, it could immediately start assessing things, not necessarily stuff that I didn't know or did know, but now I was like, I can identify a little bit better, um, just from the class that I went to. So, and 
obviously with dog training, there's different thoughts and different um, theories and you know styles basically. So um, our kennels Adler horse with the with the Reavers, they're again known known across the world for their dogs and what they're able to do with their police their their police uh, training program. Um, so that's what we go to, and I mean they're awesome. But again, that's a different style as opposed to somebody who's back east like Von Lick or you know stuff like that. So it's all on how deep you really want to how deep you really want to get into the weeds as far as like the dog behavior stuff. Um, there's a ton of articles out there, ton of books, ton of videos. So it's just a matter of going through and finding what works for you. Okay, so you guys are encouraged to kind of keep adapting your animal behavior and keep applying that to your training. Yes. Yes. Alrighty. So Sergeant Padilla, while I guess I'm along the behavior route, you mentioned that you've taken on um, a dog recently yourself and you're working with the training. What are some resources you found helpful when it comes to learning the behavior behind it? Your biggest resources are your fears. Um, okay. Those who work with you, those that have dogs and that can that can in the right direction, they'll, they'll tell you when, hey, your dog's on odor or, you know, if it's something that I can't recognize or, or something that I've never seen a dog do. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. now that I've watched my dog for, you know, a good eight weeks, I know that, you know, when her tail's up, you know, and her ears are, are tilted back and she's, you know, sniffing a certain area, I know she's in the area of odor um, because she'll, she doesn't do that um, otherwise anywhere else. Um, so, you know, each dog is different. So you might have a dog that automatically will sit down when he, uh, he or she comes on odor. You might have a dog who wants to, um, what's called a, uh, uh, a push with the nose and, and to show the handler. So each dog is different, but uh, watching dogs over and over again, you'll know which dog prefers what alert. Uh, what we prefer is, is the dog sitting down. But the, there are times where, you know, you, you set an odor up high and the dog's up on two legs. And sometimes the dog's not going to come down and sit down. The dog's just going to stay in one position and stay in that position mm -hmm. until he or she gets paid. Um, so, you know, sometimes as a handler, you have to reward because you don't want to wait too long because then after that, the dog might get frustrated. And then, you know, he'll, he or she'll get off that, uh, get off that odor and then it's going to make me frustrated. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's not mm -hmm. good because, you know, when I get frustrated, they say it goes it goes straight down to the dog from from one end of the uh, the leash to the other. So it's important that you know me as a tech handler uh, that I am that I'm always happy with the dog and, and I'm always praising the dog. So. That's such a great relationship, just constant praise. I love it. Um, <laughs> so before I forget, real quick, audience, if you do have any questions for our amazing officers, please go ahead and start dropping those in the chat box and we will start filtering through them in a couple of minutes. But I did have one last question for you both. If somebody wanted to start researching this and pursue it as a career field, what would you recommend they start with? You want to take that one, Sarge? <laughs> Um, so as far as if you're in, in law enforcement, so I'll go in law enforcement, not law enforcement. If you're in law enforcement, um, you know, I always go into briefings as much as I can, like, Hey guys, this is kind of what we do. We put on training for patrol teams. Um, it's more of like familiarization with the dogs, you know, Hey, who likes dogs? Who doesn't like dogs? It's a big deal for us. You know, if you're going to be on my search team, you have to be okay around the dog to an extent, right? Like, obviously like dogs are high drive dogs and they're out looking for for bad guys right so it's something that i have to worry about not so much them um so if you're interested to be a decoy think of handlers for you i always say hey come up we'll go somewhere i'll put you in the bite suit i'll give you a little what's what and how to and you'll take a bite from my dog and hey you know this I'll get little tips in here and there and you know Take Charlie off and be like, all right, cool. Hey, how'd that go? Did you like it? Did you not like it? You know, because I've had some people like, eh, that was cool, but not for me. And I have other people like, dude, that was awesome. You know, and they're like, cool. <laughs> and we're going to send you to a, a two day course out at our kennel. And they're going to kind of, you know, it's more of a gut check, I would say, because mm -hmm. they're going to put you in, in some situations when you're like, oh no, like I'm going to get bit by this dog and he's over there. Like, you know, they have to 
comprehend that and be able to uh, you know, hold their composure to an extent. And then later on after they go to that, then, hey, we have training every Thursday and we're hosting this week. Cool. Hey, we need decoys. We need somebody to come out. And, you know, while we're out there, you know, we'll go put them in a bite suit in a room, find a door or whatever the scenario is. And then we'll run our dogs on on that scenario. And it usually ends with a bite or whatever the scenario dictates. And, you know, if they like it, like for me, I loved it. I thought it was awesome. You know, being the bad guy and you can hear the dog getting closer. <laughs> you can feel your own stress level going up because you're like, oh, no, these dogs are going to find me. I'm going to get bit. Right. And your heart starts beating a little bit faster and then getting bit. And then you understand the dog behavior. You understand what dogs do did well, but not so well. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're able to build, um, you know, that role decks of information. So later on, when I became a handler about a year and a half after I started decoying, you know, I would already understand what kind of what my dog was doing um, in certain scenarios. Now, if you're not law enforcement, um, kennels are a good place to learn. They're always usually always hiring kennel hands to handle the dogs. Um, there's two guys that work out and in Riverside right now, one of them, awesome dude. He's probably one of the best decoys I know, if not the best decoy I know. Um, if we ever have an issue, or if I have an issue with Charlie or something, he's doing something weird, like, hey man, this is what I got. Can I come out? Can you decoy for Charlie real quick? Yeah, no problem. And, you know, I pick his brain all the time. Like, I've only been doing this for two years. That's dropping the bucket um, of the grand, you know, big picture. But going out and doing, doing kennels, um, just, Picking, picking the kennel hands brains. I mean, that's probably a, the best place to start, not in law enforcement. And then, hey, you know, I want to handle a dog in law enforcement. Cool. You know, I would say do research on a good department that has a canine program, you know, has a little bit of, uh, of movement there, right? If you go to too small of a department, you know, maybe they don't even have a canine program. And then obviously you go to the bigger departments, it's going to be harder to get in to an extent, right? The competition for canine handlers, um, pretty stiff most departments that I've I've uh, come in contact with talk to their handlers talk to people who run the the, the canine sections um, you know it's competitive so you're gonna have to show each one to be there and um, really put the work in okay so looking at the questions that people are submitting to us one of the big ones right now is it seems that German Shepherds and Malinois are the most common breeds. Is there a specific reason behind using those breeds? Um, I think it's just from, again, from the sports, right? German Shepherds, the, the trend, you know, back in the day was German Shepherds. Still, people still have Shepherds. They're typically bigger, um, heavier dogs. Uh, they, got, mm -hmm. they have really good bites. They have bigger mouths for the most part. Um, now it's kind of more shifting to a Malinois. Um, or we have Dutch Shepherds too, which is kind of like a Malinois, just different colorings. Um, mm -hmm. Like Charlie's Malinois, we have three Mal's and one Dutch Shepherd, um, and then Sarge's Malinois. Mostly it's the drive. Both dogs have a lot of drive. So it's easier for us to kind of get what we want out of the dogs when they have a high drive. Um, the Shepherd, the difference between the Shepherds and the Mal's, the Mal's are a little bit more streamlined. streamlined. They have a little bit of less mm -hmm. health issues. They're a little bit lighter. Um, Charlie's okay. 75 to 80 pounds, give or take. Um, a lot easier to lift than a 95 pound German Shepherd. A um, lot less hair in the car. I know that doesn't sound like a big deal to most people, but you know, when you roll down the windows and furs flying around, it, it makes a difference, <laughs> um, especially for my uniform. Um, but it just, I think with Malinois, I like Malinois a little bit better just because they're a little bit smaller. I'm not that big of a guy. So easier for me to kind of control. Um, and the, the health issues, we, we're probably going to get more years out of a Malinois than a German Shepherd. I think the biggest concern is hips. Uh, with German Shepherds, you can get uh, hip dysplasia yeah. uh, in about 50% of the dogs. Whereas Malinois, I think it's like a 5% uh, rate of Malinois will get hip dysplasia at about eight or nine years. So uh, having a dog that's going to last a while, a dog that's durable, and at the same time, they're both herding dogs. So they love mm -hmm. to run around all over the place. And they're great at searching, and, and they're constant, constantly moving. You know, I, you can't see our dogs right now in the video, but mine's underneath me. 
biting and chewing the toy. His is behind him, biting and chewing the toy. They're always getting stimulus. Uh, so they're always doing something. And, you know, after we're done, we're probably going to go out and do some training. And these dogs are going to act like, you know, hey, I'm ready to do, you know, Whatever. two hours of training at 100%. Because they, they don't care. They just want to they want to have fun to them. It's play. So. Okay. And they're incredibly beautiful dogs. You guys showed them to me earlier, and we'll show them in a bit. But your dogs are beautiful. Um Oh, okay. We have a two for question. So someone wants to know how many K-19 teams does Pasadena PD have and how long has the program been around? Um, we have six K-9s right now. Um, right now we have uh, four, uh, four of the teams are apprehension dogs, and which means okay. they, they search for people. Uh, out of those four teams, three of them are dual purpose right now. Uh, one's narcotics and two are explosive dual purpose. And then the brand new dog that we just got is eventually going to be narcotics. So we're going to have two explosives and two narcotics. Uh, my dog is a purpose explosives dog and a community engagement tool. So her job is when she goes out there, she comes and hangs out with the community um, when she's not uh, doing detection. And then finally, we have a Springer Spaniel uh, that really no one really talks about. Uh, but uh, that dog is part of our uh, special investigation major narcotics unit. So they keep that dog with them in case they ever need a search. And, you know, she's, or he's probably about uh, 25 pounds, smaller dog, and they take him everywhere. Um, and, and you would never know he's a, a narcotics dog. So. And how long has your program been around? Our first handler was um, uh, an officer by the name of, of Joe Allard. And at the time, he did have a Springer Spaniel. And that was in the late 80s. Um, and then from there, we went to... Uh, uh, apprehension dogs, and we had two appreh We've always had two apprehension dogs. It wasn't until uh, we decided to add an explosives uh, uh, dog that we thought it was, hey, it, this is going to be a benefit to us because of all the, uh, the the operations that the city puts on, including the Rose Bowl, the Rose Parade, the UCLA games, the concerts, the soccer mm -hmm. games. Um, after 9-11, everything changed. So people went away from narcotics and they went to um, explosive detection because they saw a need, they, they saw a need for it. And, okay. uh, you know, being with uh, Pasadena, all, our, all eyes are on Pasadena on January 1st. Uh, but the work up to that is, is two, three weeks, you know, even before Christmas. You know, right. our dogs are getting work, uh, working at, you know, the boat builders, uh, locations, uh, going sweeps uh, of, the, uh, of Colorado Boulevard two weeks prior, uh, making sure the bleachers are safe. You know, these dogs get a lot of work in, in, in a three and a half week period up until the game. And then even the three days after where you have the float viewing, you know, our dogs are out there uh, doing sweeps, you know, at 4.30 in the morning, even before everything starts. And my guys stay there all day just in case, you know, there's suspicious packages or anything uh, of, 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 of the sort. But uh, these dogs get a lot of work in um, this year. We really didn't have much because of the pandemic, but once everything opens up, and it seems like it's going to, um, everything's going to get back to normal. So there's going to be a need for these dogs. And uh, now having three dogs, um, it allows us uh, to do a lot more. Uh, usually we have to call out other cities. You know, you have three dogs that are um, that come from the same agency. We'll all be on the same page. We'll all be doing the same searches, and we'll all be helping each other out. Um, let's see. Oh, someone would like to know what kennels do you pull your dogs from and at what age? So we get our dogs from Adler Horse Kennel. It's in uh, Harupa Valley. Uh, every, depend, the dog's age just depends on what we're looking for. We'll go out on what they call a show day where they bring, up, bring back a bunch of dogs from Europe. Um, and, you know, we tell Mike Reaver who runs it right now, runs the kennel. He inherited it from his dad. Uh, dad's still there. He's like 84, 85, still takes bites. It's a crazy guy. Anyways, um, we'll go out there like, you know, hey, Mike, we're looking for a dog for a new handler. Um, you know, you like he and Cardi has an idea of, you know, how busy Pasadena is, what we're kind of looking for as far as drive. And, you know, probably gonna be a dual purpose dog. So we need a detection side. So needs a little bit of toy drive. Uh, we'll go out there. It's usually the whole unit will go out. Um, We'll all we'll take turns putting bite suits on um, and we'll run dogs in simple scenarios and kind of, you know, weed out what we like, what we don't like, um, you know, critique the dogs. And then we find a dog we like, 
put the dog in our one of our cars and it's our dog so it, it just it kind of just the the whole testing thing is again one of those things where you know you ask 10 different agencies they have 10 different styles so it's kind of just whatever and then the age obviously wants something a little bit younger but you know there is benefit to having a three and a half year old dog you know that maybe is a military dog um for whatever reasons ended up in the adler horse kennel and you know uh, officer velasquez has canine ito he was an army dog uh super good in obedience and you know they handed Dad danny a really good dog and there's a lot you know he has growing pains too but maybe it's not as much as getting a one and a half year old dog you know with little obedience so there's give and take to everything okay um let's see oh uh somebody said they never heard the term pay your dog out what does that mean and what form of rewards do you guys use so paying your dog uh refers mm -hmm. when we get an elicited response um that is positive such as an, uh, an alert to odor um, mm -hmm. we, we have what's called a, um, a word that will, you know, allow them to know that they're correct. In this case, we say yes, but, uh, we say it in a high pitched voice because we want to have fun with the dog and we want the dog to have fun. So if, if, if Peppa were to locate an odor and she sits down or, um, shows a change in behavior that is distinctive to her alerting to an odor of explosives, you know, I'll wait for her. Um, to not look at me, and then I'll say yes in a high pitched voice, and then she'll look at me, and she'll come back to me. There's probably about six to eight feet between us, and by that time I have to pull out her favorite toy. And in this case, I'm not going to pull it out right now, but it's a uh, rubber chucket ball with a uh, a nylon um, attachment to it. To her, that is her toy or her reward when she um, when she gets a uh, an order correct. Um, and in, in Officer Getz's case. Um, yeah, this is a jute. It's just a roll of burlap, and Charlie's been chewing on it. Um, and he's he's right here staring at me because he wants it back. But this is what I use to to reward him. So you know, put it in basic terms. Put it in basic terms. When you get a puppy, right, and you're teaching it how to sit, you know, you're gonna lift up on the collar, you're gonna push down on on its back end. As soon as his or her butt hits the ground. You're gonna say good girl right and you're gonna give them a toy you're gonna give them food or whatever you know i have a i have a lab at home and with her it was like 30 minutes in a bag of treats and i had her like sitting and laying down and shaking so i i mean every dog is different some dogs aren't motivated by food charlie's not motivated by food um he likes his toy or chuck it ball or finding bad guys right that's that's a reward um in our kind of dog training right he's looking for odor and when he finds odor, that's his reward. So, you know, when we go out and do searches for, you know, bad guys and, you know, it's whatever crime, he doesn't know who we're looking for. He just knows he's looking for a bad guy who's hiding from us, right? It's like hide and seek. Um, and then as far as the explosive side, um, you know, again, he doesn't know it's a bomb, right? Or an, any kind of explosive. He just knows it's an odor that when he finds it, he sits. And when he sits, I give him his toy. So you guys kind of turn into the one big game, right? Yeah, well, that's what it is. It's play for them. Um, okay. And, and, and when it's fun for them, uh, you're going to have success. Um, and, and also when it's fun for them, it makes it fun for us because we see the end result. And, and that's where we, we take great pride in. Okay. So we're slowly coming up on time. But the final question that people keep asking is, can we please meet your dogs? Oh, no problem. Charlie. Yeah, sure. Come here. Oh, 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 oh. oh, look at them guys. So this is Canon Charlie. He's a, a Malinois from Slovakia. Um, he's coming up on what, four years old. And we've been together for two years now. Almost two years. Oh, boy. And this is uh, Peppa. Uh, she's a 18-month-old. Uh, uh, Belgian Malinois from Poland uh, through the Netherlands, and uh, we've been together for about nine weeks now. How cute. Um, Officer Getz, you mentioned that you have a dog at home. How do him and Pep get along? Huh. 
I'm sorry, him and Charlie. Charlie, um, my lab at home is seven years old, female named Maple. Um, she's more of a, a people dog, not really a dog dog. So okay. Charlie has a bunch of, and he, Charlie has a really, really high energy dog. So he'll like, they'll like try to go play, but she's just like, ah, later dude, and just runs in the house. Like I doesn't want anything to do with him. Like they're fine. They, they, they've played together before, um, mm -hmm. but usually brings a lot of energy to the table and she's, I'm gonna go lay down. Like I'm gonna go hang out with, with mom or whatever. So it kind of just depends. That's the same way. She's toy driven. So if she's got a toy in the mouth or she wants a toy, she's not going to care about um, the little Maltese that I have at the house. All she wants is her toy. She'll, she'll run circles back and forth with a toy. And it's like the Maltese is even there. So. Do they ever interact? Does the Maltese ever just try to get a reaction out of, out of Peppa? No, you know what? Uh, my, my Maltese is kind of snotty. <laughs> So he, he walks around and does his own thing, and he just he just keeps an eye on the other dog. And uh, and like I said, I have no issues. I also have a, a black golden doodle at home. He, he's a puppy. Same thing. He tried to jump all over her, and she didn't want to have anything. Okay. To do. Um, instead, she decided to jump in the pool, and the golden doodle didn't want anything to do with the pool, so he walked away. So I mean, it, it just it just all depends. I mean, these, these dogs only known each other for nine weeks, uh, but for the most part, you know, Peppa stays in her kennel. Um, she gets about 15, 20 minutes out of, of play time a day, and then uh, and when she's not working, and then and then other than that, you know, she's well rested. So when it comes time to to work or or train at in Pasadena, then uh, she knows it's time to have fun. Alrighty, and that's so cute. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. As I was at the end of the day, the dog. You know, I know I know a lot of people love dogs, and like like I love dogs, and you know, at the end of the day, they're, they're a tool for us to use, right? They're, they're here to keep people safe. You know, the unfortunate, you know, reality is, you know, these dogs do get hurt. They do get injured. They do get killed on a line of duty, but, you know, sucks to say, but I can replace my dog. You know, I can't replace another officer who's got a family at home, um, you know, I'm like somber or whatever, but that's why we use these dogs to keep everybody safe. You know, I, I hope Charlie makes it to his retirement day and that day cool man you're mine now you know you go he's gonna be coming with me and he's gonna you know live out the rest of his life in my house and my family and you know be be a part of the family because he you will be for that long you know it's all the time and uh effort we put into to him doing each other right taught me a lot teaching teach me a lot of patience so it's just one of those things that you know you, you can't lose uh lose sight on why we have these dogs. Okay, and what age do you guys retire your dogs at? You don't know if it's um, I, I try and get I try and get six or seven years out of my dogs uh, in the department. Last dog that we had went nine years. The dog before that went 10 years. Um, wow. So it, it, it just all depends um, on the dog. You know, you check the health every year to determine if the dog's fit for duty. And, and a lot of times, you know, these guys take great care of their dogs. They feed them well. Um, they take them to the vet when they should, and, and they take really good care of them. So the more you take care of your dog, the longer they're going to last. And, and and none of these guys want to want their dogs to retire anyway. Uh, but they know that you know one of these days um, we're going to have to retire the dog, either due to an injury or, or just the dog's lost his step. Uh, and when we do do that. We do uh, um, we do give. Uh, the handler the option of buying the dog from the city for a dollar. Wow. Okay. So, so there's a transfer they, ownership, they, and yeah. and they sign off on a form saying that the dog's no longer a police dog. The dog's retired, and and, and is now uh, a companion for the handler. <laughs> okay. Well, we have gone ahead and hit time, so I want to say thank you to you both for coming on here and showing us what it means to be an officer that works with the canine and sharing some of your expertise and your dogs with us. So thank you so much, guys. All righty. And for everybody else who joined us, thank you for taking the time out of your Friday to join us today and have a great day, everybody. Have a great weekend. Do, do, do. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.